joined now by Coach Luke Fickle. Uh, the uh, Bearcats are 8-0 and overall, win 6-0 and in the American Athletic Conference play. Uh, Coach, congratulations on an outstanding season and a second consecutive championship game appearance. Uh, can you get your thoughts on getting to this point and another matchup with, with Tulsa, please? Well, obviously, we're incredibly excited, um, obviously, to be at home as well. But just, just you know, from the start of the season, it, it's been like for everybody, it's been quite a whirlwind. And you know, to know where we are right now, um, where we were in August when, you know, we kind of were out away at camp and had to take a pause to figure out what our team wanted to do because there was a lot of things around us that were, you know, that were closing down and shutting down. And, um, you know, the Big Ten, when they closed down, just being in this area was, was a really difficult one. And so our guys had to make some decisions um, all the time when we were away. And, uh, you know, this was why we made the decision. It was just in case we had an opportunity to really play and, you know, to get a season in that we wanted a ch an opportunity, uh, a chance uh, at a championship. And, and that's what we've wanted since we got here. Um, that's been our goal every every start of every year is give us an opportunity to play for a championship. And um, through everything that's happened, you know, from 21-day layoffs to another 21-day layoff to we'll be up being a 28-day layoff, it's, um, it's kind of all coming to a head uh, on Saturday, and we're, we're excited about it. Okay, we'll take our first question from Coach Fickle from uh, Justin Williams from The Athletic, please. Uh, hey, Coach. Just curious, after the past couple of weeks, what can you tell us about the general health and availability? Uh, I know it's early in the week, but how you're feeling heading towards Saturday? Well, I think most, I think all of our team now, for the most part, um, is back off of you know the protocols for a lot of things. But I don't know that you all know that we all know that uh, you know different things are affected by it. So um, I think we're in pretty good shape and in pretty good place right now, getting through um, some minor things that that come along with having you know, being off for 14, 15, 16 days or so. Um, but other than that, I think we, I think we should hopefully by, uh, by Saturday be in good shape with, with just about everybody. Okay, we'll go next to Chad Brendel from Bearcat Journal. Coach, uh, how is the, you talked about getting back to practice uh, last week. How, how do you feel the team has responded to getting back out there and, and being able to get them focus back in on playing for a championship on Saturday? Well, they're excited. That's what they love to do. It's just kind of unique as you're coming back and knowing that you've been off for, you know, you know, not having done anything for like 14 days. And, you know, you know, there's work to be done, but there's also, you know, some, some things you've got to do as you work yourself back in, not myself, but as you work all the different guys back into it. So um, it's been kind of unique um, as they come back and, and started to work and we're hoping to, to even play last week to, to, you know, to then have to push it and play this week. Um, so it's, it's been a unique challenge. Some people would think that, hey, you've had some time off, kind of like you're preparing for a bowl game. The reality is that's not it. That's not the case in any way because you just had no um, real idea how everything was going to go and what was going to go. And um, it was quite, kind of a roller coaster even the last, you know, last week. So, um, again, I think our guys are really excited that they're back to practice and they're back to playing. Um, you know, by Wednesday, I'm sure they'll, they'll uh, really hope that uh, Saturday can get here as soon as possible. Take the next question from Joe Daneman, please. Hey, Luke, we've been asking so many questions here the last, uh, you know, month, six weeks about the college football playoff, but you've been steadfast in saying that your number one priority is winning a conference championship. Why is the conference championship such a priority for you and your football team? Well, that was the goal when we walked in here. And, and it wasn't even – we didn't even say win a championship. We said, hey, we want to play for championships. I think you always got to kind of put things in line and how you want to do things. And first and foremost is you got to give yourself an opportunity. And obviously, if, if you play well enough, you can have a chance to play for a championship. Um, if you play well enough there, then you have a chance to win a championship. So I just think it's, it's all making sure our guys can kind of lock in and focus from the day we walked in the door here four years ago um, – about the little things that you got to do in the process that, that uh, has to go and take place in order for you, you know, to see goals that, that, uh, that you dream of down the other line. Okay. We'll go next to Brendan Stahill, please. Hey coach. I know uh, you purposely don't watch on Tuesday nights when they put out those rankings, but, but I saw you on with Fox this week. So I'll ask her Fox college football. Uh, did you feel disrespected at all that you guys got moved down a spot to eight when you're undefeated and, and you're competing for a conference title? 
No, no. I, I, I've always believed that you, sometimes you're out of sight, out of mind, and it's, it hasn't been a great situation for us um, because we haven't had the ability to play. And, you know, from the time any of this talk started about anything like that, uh, I've always said you got to be playing your best ball at the end of the year. Well, if you're not playing, it's kind of difficult to, to show your best ball. Um, so things like that are going to happen, I would imagine. And, again, I don't put a whole lot of stock into it. Um, wasn't even – I'm not even sure I knew that unless I would happen to scroll through Twitter or, or something and see, see us post something via, uh, via our own websites. Um, but I, I don't put a whole lot of stock. I don't, my, I got a lot of the things that rise and drop my blood pressure and, and, and all the other things going on. And fortunately that's not one of them. We'll go next to Bill Dennison from WLW radio. Coach, uh, can you give us a scouting report on uh, Tulsa for this Saturday? Yeah, they're a really good football team. Um, I think more than anything that their ability, they're, they're a battle tested. They have had more really, really tight and close games from day one, from their first game of the year against Oklahoma State, um, to their ability to you know be down uh, in a bunch of games and just continue to grind it out, find a way to be successful um, at the end. And that's what you. That's what you want in the program. That's what you want in your team. And, and I think more than anything, I could say, um, obviously, offensively, I, I, they are battle tested and they find a way, uh, whether they've been down um, in a lot of games, they found a way to, to kind of grind it out and, and outlast a lot of people. Going on to Morgan Beard from KTUL in Tulsa, please. Hey, Coach, uh, over here in Tulsa, we've been talking to uh, Philip Montgomery about Zayvon Collins all year long and that defense uh, in total from you. And I guess when you've uh, prepared for them, maybe the two or three different times that you've thought you were going to play them this year. Uh, what do you see from Zayvon? I mean, he's getting a lot of attention with these you know, postseason awards and whatnot. So what do you see from him? And what do you think of uh, him as a player, just the way he's kind of just exploded this year? He should. He should be up for a lot of those things. I mean, just a, an incredibly well-rounded football player. Um, Sometimes you'd see a big guy like that and you'd say, okay, he's, you know, he's a run stopper. And then, you know, all of a sudden, well, you know, he is six foot four or six five. So, you know, he's hard to throw the ball over. So he, you know, he does a decent job. No, he does a really good job in both phases. And I think that's where uh, he's got a really bright future in playing the game. Obviously I hope he gets the recognition he deserves throughout this, you know, end of the season. Um, but in the long run, I think he's got a really, really upside because he can do pretty much everything. You know, he can play the run, he can rush, and he does a really good job in coverage as well. So um, regardless of what kind of defense you play at the next level, you're looking for guys that can play in all three phases like that. And a quick follow-up, uh, Montgomery also likes to talk about the rest of the defense, saying he thinks he has two all-conference cornerbacks as well. What do you see from Tulsa on that side of the ball, outside of Zavin as well? What makes them so difficult? And I guess, uh, I guess what do you see from them uh, that – I guess, presents such a challenge for you guys? Well, I think length is a big deal. And I think that they've done a great job as you look across the board, especially in that back end, you know, corners that are long, um, you know, and they do a good job that, you know, some of their eight man drop stuff and mixing up coverage. So they're not, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, out on an island all the time. Um, so I think that the, the, the balance to being able to mix it up uh, gives their guys a great opportunity uh, to be aggressive, whether that's, you know, clouding it up and, and being able to trigger and, and play some run defense as a corner at times. Um, and their length, they, they, just like you said with David, I think it gives you a lot of issues uh, when you've got guys, especially in the back end with a lot of length. Hey, we'll go next to Keith Jenkins from the Cincinnati Inquirer, please. Hey, Luke, you, you touched on this previously a little bit earlier, but you know, when you have so much time to prepare for a single opponent, what could be a con to that for you just from a preparation standpoint? Well, you start over evaluating things. Um, I think if you start preparing too early, which is, you know, what's difficult. Um, if you start preparing too early, by the time you get to Tuesday or Wednesday's practice, your guys are bored and they can't kind of, you know, get in a rhythm um, to kind of get that point in time where they, you know, on Saturday night that they're ready to roll. And if you get them too early, you know, get them ready too early because you start game planning and working on the things that you're going to see. Uh, so early, I think it can backfire on you at times. So it's quite a balance, and that's why it's been so unique with, you know, having a, you know, a layoff and then coming back and not knowing exactly, you know, as you were trying to come back, it, when you were going to play. And, and um, so it, it's been a challenge, let's just say. 
Okay, we'll go back to Joe Daneman. The next question, please. Coach, to, uh, to follow up on my question earlier about the, the conference championship and how that's something you can control, and that's a goal you can put out there in the whole season, that's the one thing you can control is by winning games to get there. Obviously, the college football playoff is out of your control. So my question is, it, it's been such a talker amongst your fan base, the college football playoff here the last month. How much of that is something that you even care about, considering that you can't control it as a football coach? Well, I mean, I can't lie that I don't care about it because that, that would be a lie. And I, and I can't say that in a sense because, <clears throat> you know, we, we use it in, in recruiting, you know, and it, it generates and creates momentum for our program. Um, not to mention our kids love it, you know. And when, you, when you've got positive momentum, whether it's, you know, talk or this, that, and that, that's the greatest thing about what college football has. You know, they don't put 64 guys in a, in a bracket and say, well, it's pretty easy to figure out who's the best one because you all play each other and you go. Um, you create some controversy in, in college football because you, you got you know, a bunch of different people that believe that they deserve a shot. Um, you know, so with that controversy can creates more talk and it does the same thing for us in our program. I think it's great for our community. I think it's awesome for, for recruiting. Uh, you just got to know how to handle it. And, you know, you worry, I worry as a coach, you know, if our guys get too tied up and worrying about things like that, that they can't control, uh, it can take away from the things that they can control and what they need to do. So, there's a balance to it. I, I understand. Um, obviously it's always great to even be in the mention to, to, to put yourself in a position where uh, you're even mentioned, it can be talked about. Uh, and then you got to use it. You got to use it in the positive way, whether it's with your team or with your program or in a recruiting or, or within your community. So, um, you know, there, it's tricky. Uh, you know, you gotta be smart with it, but I think that all in all, it, it does a lot for our program. We'll go back to Chad Brendel, Bearcat Journal for the next one, please. Coach, when you watch this Tulsa team, do you see any of maybe what you guys were going through the past couple of years in building that winning mentality, playing a lot of close games? Um, you know, is there familiarity there with you when you watch them? Oh, I, I think so. I think that, that you know, I don't know, Phil's been there for, for, for a while. Um, but even last year, as, as they came in here with, you know, uh, I don't even know what their record was, but I knew that they, you know, had had a lot of close games and hadn't won them. Um, and I thought it was a really good football team when they came in here and then they left out of here and I knew it was a really good football team. Um, so you've seen it, it continue to grow. And I think that's where you, you really kind of build who you are, you know, and, it, and you love to build who you are by having some of those close wins and comeback wins because it can, you grow even faster. Like, you know, happened to us, I think in, in year two, um, but I think that you definitely see a battle-tested team and has fought through a lot of those things because a year before they probably lost some of those close games, and this year they've been phenomenal in those close games. Go back to Justin Williams from the Athletic, please. Coach, I know you'd prefer to focus on just the football stuff, and you've talked a lot this year that you haven't had that luxury. No one really has. How have you, how have you seen yourself grown or change as a coach, whether the past couple of weeks everything you've been dealing with or just going all the way back to August? I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess in some ways you really got to rely upon a lot of other people because you gotta, you gotta listen. Um, you know, whether that's your other coaches, whether that's the players, the leadership group on your team, um, you're trying to figure out, I, I, I use the example of, of 2020 and you got to have ability to be flexible, whether it's, you know, the COVID stuff, whether it's canceled games, whether it's social and job, all, um, are great for us to grow, whether it's as a football program, as a coach, as a leader, uh, as a father. Uh, and and your, our ability, my ability um, to kind of rely upon a lot of other people and, and listen more than, than I talk, um, because there's a lot of different things they go through, whether they're assistant coaches' heads or a lot of the guys in our team's heads, um, just with everything that has gone on from the start of camp um, through this entire season. Okay, we'll go next to Gary Miller, Local 12, please. Coach, uh, one of the reasons, I know it's easier to get in the Final Four if you're closer to it. So one of the reasons the committee gave for Iowa State jumping was the wins over Texas and West Virginia. With so many conference championships coming up this weekend, do you feel like these two teams could play in any of them, Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, and, and be competitive and have a chance to win them? I do. I mean, I have. I can't be. I haven't studied every other, you know, conference or, or program. Um, 
but I think it's pretty evident. I think what, what Tulsa has done this year and, you know, the ability to, like I said, to be all good in all three phases, I mean, you, you've got to be able to win close games. And they have done a great job of that. They played, obviously, Oklahoma State, who um, at one time was up there as well. Uh, you know, and we've been battle tested. I think that, uh, you know, we maybe haven't had one of those games this year that uh, somebody would kind of reference back um, you know, whether it was a, you know, an SEC team or something like that. But I think in the way that which we've played in, in all three phases, you know, playing really well defensively, offensively, um, and really dynamic in, in the special teams, I think it gives us a chance. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I think that we would be able to play. I, I believe Tulsa would be able to play uh, in any of these other conference championships and be in a really good position. I don't pay attention to Vegas. I don't know what Vegas would say. Um, and most coaches would say that about their team, but I, I do believe it because it's not a one-dimensional team on our side, and I don't think it's a one-dimensional team on Tulsa's side either. We'll go next to Jason Sam, BearcatReport.com. Hey, Coach, you're obviously not the only one to deal with, you know, layoffs this year. There's been pauses, obviously, with everybody deals with COVID and stuff, but Going into your, this situation specifically, like what have you done or how, how, how are you planning on hopefully, um, you know, eliminating any rust or rough, bad starts or anything from your team just due to the layoff and not having that game action? Well, we try. I mean, we tried to have some semblance of a, of a scrimmage on Saturday. You know, um, obviously it's not a scrimmage. Obviously it's not live. Obviously you're not tackling. Um, but just even going through, you know, what a pregame feels like, you know, um, what shifting from, you know, from kickoff to, to defense to, you know, to punting and, and, and just the, the, the normal interactions of a, of a game. Because to me, the things that happen are, you know, fundamentally, you, you know, you're, you're just, you're lax. You know, you haven't ran the kickoff team out there. You haven't substituted on third downs and, and situations like that. And so we tried to go through, a, you know, in some ways a mock game as best we possibly could just to get our minds um, back into the flow of things. And I mean that as a player, I also mean that as, as calling the game as well, both offensively and defensively. So, uh, you know, we, the good thing I guess you'd say is we came back from camp and I think had 20 some days before our first game. And then in the middle of that season, we had a bye and then we obviously canceled with the first time for Tulsa. And then we played the following week and we had 21 days off there. So, you know, all of which we, we at least had a better plan because we knew you know, when the game was going to be and what was coming ahead. This one was even more unique because you weren't really sure. Um, so nonetheless, I hope and believe that, that our guys with the maturity and, you know, the older guys that we have, that uh, we have done a good enough job since we've done it twice this year. And, and you know, but we'll tell. You know, Saturday will tell. Time for two more. We'll go to uh, Caleb Noe from WCPO, please. Hey, Coach, uh, I want to ask about Des Ritter a little bit here. Obviously, I mean, everybody's seen how he's come onto the scene this year, but he seems like a guy who just, like, quietly gets the job done and does his thing. Um, I, I want to ask you, though, I hope it's not a broad question. I want to ask you who he is off the field. Like, what do we not see from Des Ritter by just watching the games on Saturdays? Well, I, you probably haven't seen because when you say he's a guy that's kind of come on the scene this year, for us, he's been on the scene for three years. You know, I mean, he was a red shirt guy when we came in here and, you know, had no idea what, who he was. And he just was running around over there on the scout team. And um, had he not probably been hurt as a freshman in camp, he probably would have had some opportunities to play in his true freshman year, just based on, you know, the way the season was going for us. And um, he's a guy that is, is incredibly competitive in what he does. Um, I, I really do think he's one of those guys that, that lives football. You know, he just, he loves the game of football and studying the game of football and um, all about the game of football. He is a student of the game, which is why I think he's got a bright future. Um, you know, uh, last year, I think he struggled a little bit because he is such a perfectionist and he wanted everything. He believed in that second year, he wanted everything to go as he thought it and planned it and planned it out in his mind. And I think he went through some ups and downs realizing that it's never going to happen quite the way he, you, you, you envision it, and um, there's a lot of things that are just going to have to do and, and continue to do a, a bit on the fly um, because it's so unique of how everybody prepares against you, you know, in general. So he, he's a guy that, that loves the game. I think that uh, he's got a still a, a high ceiling. He can continue to grow um, in a lot of areas just to, as a football player, and, and the sky's the limit. Okay, I'll take the final question from uh, Keith Jenkins with Cincinnati Inquirer, please. 
Hey, Luke, it, it, the weird thing about this week is, yes, this is a huge game to prepare for for Saturday, but then the early signing period starts on Wednesday. So how does that, how are you able to balance that? And is that a challenge for you as you're looking at this week ahead? There's no doubt, because that's a big part of our program. I mean, recruiting is a huge part. Now, I'm not saying we were going to by any means push um, anything that we're doing to prepare for this game. Uh, but, but we'll make a big day of Wednesday. Wednesday will be a big preparation day football-wise, but then it'll be a big day for us, uh, hoping and believing we, we sign probably our entire class um, on Wednesday. So, you know, we'll have a balance to it. Obviously, we're continuing to work. I think that's what you do throughout the entire season anyway. Um, but continuing to work this, you know, these last few days to make sure we're, we're good for Wednesday morning as well. So uh, there's a lot on the plates of all these coaches um, that uh, they're excited about of, of – you know, getting to Wednesday and then getting to Saturday because a lot of prep and a lot of work have been put into both both phases there. Coach, thanks so much for giving us a few minutes today. We look forward to uh, joining you in Cincinnati at the end of the week. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Coach. Right, that is Cincinnati Coach Luke Fickle. Uh, up next, we will go to, I believe we have ready, Commissioner Resco already. Uh, Mike, are you, uh, maybe can see if I can unmute you here. I, I'm now unmuted. Can you Here hear me, Chuck? We got you, Mike. All right. So we're joined Thank now you. by Commissioner Mike Oresco. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you can, uh